and we all all said good morning and kind of said who is here and everything. Sorry, but I was so interrupting. I don't think formally we've said good morning and who's who all's here. Um, I'm Carrie Hodai with OHCS. I'm the um, manager of the uh, Manufactured Home Replacement Program. Uh, Rick Abrego, Assistant Director for the Manufactured Housing Department. I'm Bill Van Vliet with NOAA. Uh, Everett Horvath, uh, OHCS uh, Manufacturing Replacement Navigator. Uh, Shauna McDonough, Program Analyst with MMCRC and OHCS. Catherine Dalton, Executive Director of the Community Dispute Resolution Center. We're one of the mediation centers for the manufactured home. Uh, Alex, Alex Sheba, Relations Manager for Umatel Electric Cooperative. Lisa Rogers, Castle Horgan. Peter with Castle Horgan. Eddie Savella with <clears throat> Energy Trust of Oregon Program Navigator for the Manufactured Home Replacement Program. I'm Austin Bosworth. I'm uh, with OCDR <clears throat> here in Eugene, Oregon. And I'm Tani with Crack 3. And it looks like we may have gotten most folks on the phone. And so we'll go ahead and kick it off with our agenda. I can go ahead and paste the items into the chat so we can kind of stay on topic this morning. And the first item on the agenda after that welcome is the legislative session end and any recent updates? And Bill, I think you were going to cover that one. Um, yeah, I was going to cover the conference overview, but I can um, just talk a little bit about uh, at least what I'm aware of. I'm not aware of all the, I probably don't have all the budget stuff, so I'll have to let the department folks talk about the budget stuff that came through. Um, um, but the, the primary bill that we've talked about before um, on uh, House Bill 3151 just implemented a number of different uh, things and made some, some updates to statute. Um, and one was um, to clarify um, um, some some technical fixes to the dispute resolution uh, statute that had been passed, I believe in 21, if I remember, I wasn't a part of any of that component of the bill. Um, there was um, um, an expansion of the loan funds for uh, the acquisition of parks for preservation activities to include construction lending, um, and um, I believe um, uh, Rick is, has a question in to the Department of Justice about whether that applies to um, uh, the existing money that's been allocated um, to the CDFIs that administer it or whether it has to be limited to only new money that comes in. Um, and Rick, I don't think I've heard that there's a response to that yet. Have you heard any update from DOJ? Nothing as of yet. In fact, we uh, um, pinged them um, on Monday to see if we had anything and, and nothing's come back yet on that. Um, but, and so we're, 
we're waiting, unfortunately. Uh, but, um, you know, until we get some, but uh, we'll definitely let you know as soon as we get something back on that. Um, but we haven't had a, a inkling either in either direction. All right. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think a couple of us are are anxious to hear some clarification around that. Um, and um, there was a there was a change to this to the zoning statutes to allow manufactured home parks to be developed uh, without a zoning change on certain types of lands. That was an expansion of Senate Bill Eight from a few years ago. Um, and then the other major provision just clarified uh, sort of the question of who pays for what when there is a manufactured home that gets moved into a park for the first time. Um, there's been some questions about who has the responsibility to pay for certain park uh, related improvements. And we tried to just add clarity to statute and limit the things that a park owner can impose upon a new tenant moving in. Um, so that kind of covers the four major points that that bill covered. And that's all, that's all I really would have an ability to speak about. Bill, Bill, this is Kat Dalton. Um, is that basic clarification on what they're allowed to charge, is that um, to just summarize, basically, they kept it at um, anything that the the tenant cannot take with them. Well, they will not be charged for. Is that did it kind of stay that way? Yeah, for the most part, it did. There was a list of things that would still be allowed, but that was sort of the underlying premise of what the statutory change said is that a park owner can't force a resident to pay for something to install at the park that they couldn't take with them if they moved and took their home with them. Okay, thank you. Yep. Any other questions for Bill or does anyone else have anything to add on this topic? So I, I think an open question, <clears throat> getting to the money, which is what everybody likes to talk about. Um, um, you know, maybe Rick or Everett, um, if you guys could just recap what you did get for the replacement program, but then I'm also interested in the latest updates on park preservation money. I know preservation generally did not get anywhere near uh, what was requested uh, by the housing advocates, or I don't think even what the agency asked for. Uh, so interested how park preservation is going to compete with regular multifamily preservation efforts, um, if there's any updates on that. Ever go ahead and, you know, talk about the manufactured loan program that now I'm going to ping um, Ed Brown and see the amount that he received, and then I can uh, uh, try to address the rest of that. Uh, yeah, so we we ended up with uh, uh, 2.5 million um, for this uh, biennium um, with an estimation of about 300K in uh, contributing towards administrative costs. Um, and as of, uh, what about the 17th of August, those funds are fully allocated. Um, and we have 18 replacements, um, that will move forward. Um, we've just received the funding, um, for, uh, for those biennium funds and Gary is, uh, working on getting the loan documents out. So we should start, start working on those maybe if all goes well in two weeks. And then of course, you know, each replacement is, is going to be unique depending upon what, uh, where they're located, whether it be fee simple or in a preserved park. Also the permits required. Um, there's been a lot of building permit changes in the last uh, 12 months. So we're going to, I, I'm myself included in navigating my, my way through these new permit changes. A lot of them um, are based around 
um, the requirements to site a manufactured home, and then for folks who live in, in rural areas, wildfire consideration. So I'm not 100% up to date on what all those changes are, but uh, I've been putting a lot of time into it. Any questions? Um, Everett, are are some of the um, some of the changes that um, uh, our participants um, experiencing this time around, um, as far as getting the the loans going and the funds out there with home orders, is that the um, many the dealers aren't um, ordering the homes until they have a placement permit which we didn't see as much or even at all with you're breaking up there Carrie yeah Carrie you're breaking up um well actually you know that's a policy they've been, had in place for quite a while um the the thing of it is these new building codes have really changed um the ability to get that placement permit so um, going back to the last biennium, it was pretty cut and dry um, in, in, in terms of getting those placement permits. However, with these new new uh, code requirements, um, and I don't know, I don't know where they manifest from. I don't know if they're driven from the state. I've been trying my hardest to figure it out because um, it started in the community of Warrington and then moved to the community of Bend. So I'm guessing it, it started somewhere in like a domino effect. It's it's moving through all the. Um, permitting authority uh, agency so um and there's a lot of confusion it's confusing the contractors and it's 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 really a time eater um i would say it could add additional up to 60 to 45 days um, on a placement uh carrie lost to Everett on that, um, are the building code changes sort of just, I'm sorry, are they just general no code changes and a lot of them, or are they specifically focused on manufactured housing that's causing the slowdown? Um, well, for the wildfires, they're going to be, you know, obviously towards any kind of structure. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's specific towards manufactured housing. And I think, I think I think it's an interpretation because there's only, I don't know, maybe 25 siting contractors in Oregon that actually have the license to site a home. And so there's specific requirements, um, tie down points, um, tie down footings, the height of the home from the uh, final grade. So there's all these criteria. And I think in the past, the siting companies provided that information to the permitting authority. Um, and, and that, sufficed however now they're saying no they need that information prior to issuing the permit so the general contractor who does not have that license doesn't have that information so now we got to go through the home dealer to whatever contractor they're using to cite it so just it's it's a lot of uncertainty because it's it's a new requirement for the actual placement permit Bill, uh, the second part of your question, I, I, I'll have to get back to you on the amount, but I thought it was in the 30, 30 million area uh, or about midway for park preservation that um, that the park preservation uh, that, that Ed Brown runs received. Uh, but I didn't, your other part of the question, I I didn't pay attention to, I'm mean, not paying attention, but I didn't catch. No, I think that was it. Of the total 50 some million, how much might be for manufactured home park preservation? That oh, gotcha. And I can get that. Um, um, I'll get that number for you. If 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 it circles back around, I think he's in a meeting. Uh, I'll let you guys know what that number was. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone have any other questions on that? Okay. Next yeah, so it looks like the next um, topic is the committee's report to the Housing Stability Council. Um, Carrie, it looks like your information here says it'll be submitted for the October, November meeting. Is there more to say about that?
I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. My internet is just, it's popping on and off. And so you guys are freezing and unfreezing. I couldn't hear that question. Oh, the agenda says that the report for the Housing Stability Council will be submit, submitted for the October, November meeting. Um, what, what more information would you like to share about that topic? Um, I think that, um, at the last, um, uh, committee meeting, I think it was, um, the general consensus was that the report was ready, um, and that, um, we just had to, um, submit with the stability council, um, to get on the agenda. Um, and I don't know if, if it was ne uh, necessarily that we needed to present the, the report, um, uh, to the council, but submit it for them to review and then be ready for, uh, questions. Um, uh, from what I recall, maybe Bill and Rick were going to be available for those questions, or I can't remember. <laughs> Am yeah. I just, uh, volunteering you guys? No, no, no. I would, uh, I'd, I'd be at the meeting just to, uh, present that over. And if they had any questions, I'd be there, um, uh, to answer any questions they may have. Um, I, uh, so I think I was just volunteered maybe. Um, I'll have to check my calendar once you know the the date that um, it's gonna actually be on the agenda. Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely let you know on that. Thanks. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you for that reminder. Um, and uh, it looks like probably Everett is up with the replacement program review of the, the funding pipeline report. Well, we kind of kind of just went over the funding report. Um, so like we, we, we have funding for 18 homes. Um, we, we might be able to squeeze one more. We'll see um, what the total costs are. Um, luckily, right now, we're seeing construction costs kind of plateau out. So if knock on wood, if all goes well, we won't see any any increases in the project costs, and we might be able to squeeze that 19th one in. Um, but they're pretty evenly distributed between preserved parks. I would say a little about 60% about preserved parks this time around a 40% fee simple. Um, they're we tried to geographically spread them throughout the state as much as possible. Um, we are a little heavy in the Portland metro area, uh, this biennium, um, which I think is okay because we didn't do any in the Portland metro area the last biennium. Um, in terms of average costs, um, it's, you know, Bill asked about that in a meeting yesterday or trying to, trying to, trying to figure that out. Um, and trying to get a method behind the madness, um, looking at um, the a the condition of the parks, the amount of infrastructure that's needed, and then um, the amount of uh, building code difference between the the time that the original home was placed and what the building re code requirement is today. So we're looking probably for a single wide. We're 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 at that about that two twenty mark, um, and for a double wide, we're looking about two sixty to two sixty five. Yeah, any questions? I'm just curious what you're seeing in delivery times now. There was a problem, you know, a couple of years ago. That was a big problem. How are you seeing delivery times now? Uh, delivery times are between four and eight weeks right now. Uh, I don't see that changing anytime soon, um, unless there's another spike in demand. Um, the wildfires really uh, put a huge demand on the industry. Uh, again, it's that placement permit. Um, and that's that's the gosh if i could just rustle that thing down that would be awesome well let me have, again i'll reiterate uh the, the the home dealer will not order the home from the factory until they have a placement permit the reason being is that they don't want to have inventory sitting on their yard you know getting you know exposed to the weather for x amount of time because you know they warranty most of of the stuff Um, I, I'd like to add that um, of the um, fee simple um, that are in the pipeline, three of those are with um, Umatilla Electric Co-op. 
Yes, and one is with USDA. I forgot to mention that. And this is Alec. I assume are th are those combining with the program that we offer? Yes. Great. Thank you. So this is Lisa. I, I was um I was just wondering, it seems like that's I mean that's really expensive in my opinion. Um we're we're redoing a park and the the total all in cost of buying the park, doing the infrastructure and getting the homes is about two fifty per household. And so I'm wondering, is there any way to try to with you guys having these funds and doing this work, is there any way to try to maybe like reduce it down to one or two or three um manufacturers that they could choose from that maybe would would give you guys a better rate for these homes than um than you're currently getting since they know you'll be buying more than just a one like so the one off i think is where the the cost is increasing so i'm just wondering if there's anything ohcs can do that would help this process you could serve more people right and and then you get more homes it just seems like there's I think that scale thing will reduce the cost and I just don't know how to do it, but I'm thinking if there's some mechanism that we could help so that these dollars could get stretched further, it'd be great. Yeah, we're, we're stretching the dollars as far as we can, but um, factors taken into consideration A is we can't restrict um, what our client can reasonably afford. And number two, as an agent of the state, we cannot negotiate a preferential treatment to one business over another. I okay, that that seems like a disconnect to me because I feel like OHCS coordinates with other folks, um, or or gives direction on what you can and cannot do sometimes as well. So I just I'm sure it's a procurement thing and that's interesting, but it just seems like it would be a good idea to look into in some fashion just to make sure that you could do more you know that was i'll stop <laughs> i understand where you're going with that lisa the um but you know there's there's some liabilities once we start recommending who you need to go to then we have to accept some liability if something goes wrong and the basically the the i the thought is and someone says well oacs told me to go here and they and this didn't turn out so all of a sudden you know, we, we have to answer to that. So we try to allow the the um, applicants to shop. We encourage them to shop around to make sure they're getting the best deal. Sometimes uh, we do look at some of these contracts and and since Everett's, you know, has seen all of them, um, he'll make comments of that seems a little high. You might want to continue to shop. Um, ultimately, um, we do our best to try to, to, to figure things out as to, to try to, again, stretch that dollar. We only, since we we're only giving, you know, given the, the 2.5 and and we wanted to make that stretch out as far as possible. So we did definitely looked at every deal. Um, we're still a pilot program. So um, if if we're funded again in the, you know, the, the next biennium, then uh, depending on the funding, you know, we're, we would love to figure out a way to, to make our dollar stretch. I mean, um, that's the kind of the idea of just trying to stretch this thing out as far as possible. Uh, overall, um, you know, we're, we're, we're happy with what we've received, but wanted to, um, uh, we just wanted to make sure that we're, we're, we're stretching that dollar out. Yeah. I think I was just thinking more on the lines of sometimes like when you guys, um, you guys can give lists of people that, or, or organizations, companies that you can, um, that you can go to. I'll just use Mimby Wimby, any of those kind of things. So I'm just wondering if there's a structure here that could be put in place. I understand it's a pilot. I'm just trying to figure out a way to keep this going and the, to be as effective as possible and stretch the dollars as far as possible. And um, I, I'm not trying to cause any trouble or uh, no, no. Yeah. more work to anybody, but I just think this is a good thing and really important. And um, if there's a way to to help those homeowners do it a little bit more affordably because then you can give more dollars out to more people. I think it'd be great. Totally agree. And we'll definitely, you know, try to figure out a better, a better um, process and program to stretch those dollars even more. We're always thinking about it, to be honest with you.
Yeah, Lisa, I mean, honestly, there's not a lot of price difference. I mean, the, the market's going to be competitive and set, dictate the prices. I mean, there's a very, very little difference from dealer A to dealer B. Um, the biggest, you know, cost is the site work. And, and that, you know, so when that home was sited in 1970, let's say in the Willamette Valley, you know, the requirement was compacted gravel. Well, now you have to have concrete runners with, with tie down footings. So that increases the cost by 10 to $12,000. And that's just a building code update. You know, we can't control that. Or if the sewer line needs to be replaced or the water line, the water main needs to be replaced because it's so old. Those, those are what are really driving the cost of replacement. The home prices are, are pretty even keel across the board. It's, it's the site work that can be, it can be literally be $50,000 different from, from replacement to replacement due to the work that's required. Got it. Thank you. I think this is just something we should continue to talk about each each meeting and keep our eye on. Um, you know, I think I understand the conundrum that is facing the department about not wanting to steer people to certain to certain manufacturers and the and the liability issues. But on the flip side, there's also if you just accept what the buyers send in, there's no incentive for them to look for a cheaper home if one comes on to the market. Um, you know, when the St. Vincent de Paul factory opens, if those homes are cheaper but comparable, um, but a buyer doesn't have any incentive placed on it to purchase there, and I'm not saying you should steer them, but there's a way there that I think you can manage by limiting the dollar amount and not steer people. If you can find other homes out there, go for it, but this is how much we'll spend. Thank you for that conversation, everyone. Does anyone else have any final thoughts on that before we move forward on the agenda to the Manufactured Home Development Conference? All right, Bill, I think you're up. All right, um, so this is um, this is a, a training program um, that that, uh, that Noah has been planning for since uh, just prior to COVID and then COVID kind of put the brakes on everything for a few years. So we're finally getting this going. Um, and it, so we've been, we've been talking about this for a while. Uh, so we received some grant funding from Meyer Memorial Trust. We've also received uh, a generous contribution from the department. So thank you to all of you on working for the agency for supporting this too. Um, to, to educate nonprofits and housing authorities um, about manufactured housing and manufactured home parks collectively to introduce the product uh, to more of the affordable housing developers. Um, and the, the focus is on three different areas. One is on park uh, acquisitions and operations. Um, and the goal there is to expand the number of organizations engaged in the work. And we're primarily targeting the smaller parks that really don't work well for co-op conversions. Um, so that's what we'll be, uh, we'll be trying to bring some interest to that. We have, um, we have a couple of tribes, we have six housing authorities, uh, we have a couple of habitat affiliates and we have, um, I think, a, I think we're up to 10 nonprofits all registered, uh, about 45 people, I think, um, on the, on the, um, training side. Uh, the other the other aspects we'll be looking at is new park development again to increase the supply of parks in the state that are owned by mission based ownership models both co ops and nonprofits and housing authorities. Um, we can you know we're not going to get ahead of the price inflation 
for parks if we don't add to the supply. It's just a supply and demand problem. There haven't been many new parks built in about 30 years in this state. Um, and so that puts the residents in those parks at a disadvantage. Um, the final prong of the training is to look at new non-park development that uses manufactured housing. And that could be residential infill, it could be subdivisions, cul-de-sacs. There's examples of this from other parts of the country. Um, and so we're really looking at this as an affordable home ownership opportunity um, for the affordable housing developers that engage in home ownership activity. So that's the range. We have a number of folks that will be helping do the training. I see several CASA people on the call here today, uh, and they're, they're, they've been a tremendous help in supporting this, this conference. I appreciate that. The department is sending a bunch of people to talk about their resources and uh, the information they have at their disposal, and we greatly appreciate that too. And then we have some national participants as well, um, and some other local experts. So we're hopeful that it is uh, useful and impactful, um, and we can continue to raise the profile of manufactured housing as a, an affordable housing tool. Details, the conference is October 9th through 11th, the training program, I should say, and it's in Eugene. Any questions for Bill before we open it up for new business? Excellent. Well, then the floor is open for any new or walk-on items that anyone wants to bring. Don't think I'm hearing any this morning. And so uh, I think I'll just look to the committee to see if they want to wrap up this call or have any other items they want to discuss before we do that. I don't think we should wrap it up. All right, we'll do it. Hey, everybody. Um, thank you for your time today and look forward to seeing you on the next call. Thanks, all. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Do we stay on? No. Okay, I'm getting off.